Hello, everybody. How's it going? Good. So, my name is Casey Lopez Jones. Um, I will get to my own introduction in just a bit. We're from Campus Compact of Oregon, and we like to start off our training sessions, anything we do, by really acknowledging the movements that have come before us that have made us it possible for us to even be here up here with you today talking about this. Um, this has not always been a safe venture, um, even as of recently. So we appreciate the ability to be up here doing this. And we want to also just acknowledge first the indigenous peoples of this region that whose land we are now inhabiting. Um, those tribes, thank you, yes. Those tribes are the Burns Pipe. Paiute, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, Confeder Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umqua and Susla, Cow Creek Bank of Umqua Tribe, and the many other Native tribes who came before us who called this land their home. We also want to acknowledge the organizers of this symposias, symposium, Jennifer Edwards of Oregon State University and Addie Friedman with Western Washington, excuse me, Western Oregon University uh, for helping organize this event. And then of course, the movements for economic gender and racial justice as well as collective liberation, again, that have uh, come before us and made it, it possible for us to be up here today. Hi. My name, is it on? Okay, yeah. I can't tell. Uh, my name is Joshua Todd. I'm the executive director for Campus Compact of Oregon. Um, I've been with Campus Compact for four years, and before that um, was the um, youth development coordinator and then director of an agency. You might all remember back in the day, we had a system called the Commission on Children and Families. I was the director for Multnomah County. Um, and was really um, involved very deeply in the development of the county's equity and empowerment lens, which we're gonna talk about today. We also, um, we talk a lot about lifting the pedagogical veil, and so we might um, say something and then tell you why we're saying it. Um, we also share our personal, um, because we think it's really important that we create spaces where we can bring our full selves. So we don't believe in leaving our personal life at the door. We are all complex people, so while I just shared my professional, I will also show my, share my personal. I'm also a runner. I'm a father, I have two kids, a daughter who's going to be a senior, so this conversation takes on um, a different importance for me. Um, and I also have uh, a daily meditation practice, which is really important to me in this work. Thank you. And again, my name is Casey Lopez-Jones. I'm the Educational Equity Program Manager with Campus Compact of Oregon. I've been um, the Program Manager for the College Access Corps and the Equity Empowerment Corps, which I'll talk about in a little bit here, but they're both um, mentorship programs. Um, I am also a qualified administrator of the Intercultural Development Inventory, which sort of assesses one's uh, intercultural competency level along a continuum. And then my personal is that I am a, a dancer and performer, performing artist, a global community member, and that I am very interested in learning about my global family. Um, and I'm also an educator. I'm also very, I have it also a, a very spiritual practice as well. So you heard a little bit about Campus Compact. That was actually the mission and vision of our national organization, which is made up of 1,100 colleges and universities around the country. Um, here in Oregon, um, we are a presidential membership organization, so I'd like to re re uh, recognize um, President Ed Ray here at Oregon State University. They are members and have been for many years. We have 21 presidents in Oregon who sign on to the compact, and we actually have a slightly um, different, although it's just an expansion of the national agenda. We're committed to supporting Oregon colleges and universities um, to achieve a higher impact education, and what that means to us is that we put a strategic focus on the power of community-engaged learning, which is our national focus, um, to improve communities for students of color and first-generation students, and when we do that, um, by talking very explicitly about institutional racism, about power, privilege, um, the impacts of colonialism on our education system, and what we need to know about those systems of oppression to improve all of our programming, whether that be mentoring, um, teaching in the classroom, whatever our endeavor is, we believe if we start with an equity focus, we will get better outcomes at the end. So the College Access Corps and the Equity Empowerment Corps are actually two different programs. The College Access Corps is an AmeriCorps program, and for that 
reason it's not technically a mentorship program. However, it does sort of follow a similar method in that um, both programs actually, the, um, the equity and empowerment pro program also, um, they recruit people, college students, to be uh, college coaches for K-12 students. So that it's a, a bit of a trickle-down effect. Um, with a college access core, there's not as much, there traditionally is not as much emphasis put in terms of the college students and their growth. However, that is, we are changing that in the state of Oregon in, in this program, so that is more culturally responsive, so that we're making sure that as much as we can, the college coaches do have similar lived experience or understanding of the lived experience of the mentees that they're uh, working with. Um, and so right now we have 20 members enrolled in both the Equity and Empowerment Corps and the College Access Corps. Those members are placed at various sites around Oregon State and they recruit college students um, again, preferably culturally relevant college students for the programming that they're um, implementing on the sites, depending on the population of students that they're serving. Uh, the Equity Empowerment Corps specifically serves youth of color and first generation youth, while the College Access Corps specifically serves low income youth. Of course, there's a lot of crossover and intersectionality between those two groups. Oh, went too far, okay. <laughs> um, so quick learning objectives. Um, we're hoping that you'll develop uh, or deepen your understanding of a concept called white savior complex and how this might be present in our existing mentorship programs. Um, so we're gonna have a fun kind of interactive piece just in a little bit um, to think through some of that. And then we're also gonna hopefully provide people with a beginning understanding of one tool within the equity and empowerment lens that can be used to improve our policies and practices. Um, I do wanna say because there's been a call out um, for the, the state equity lens, which I think is great. Um, I do wanna just uh, point out that this is based on the work of Multnomah County and their lead author, um, Sonali Sangita Balaji, um, who wrote the equity lens. Um, it predates the state's lens by about three, four years, depending on how far back in the iteration we go. Um, and so it has a bunch of other tools that don't show up in the state lens, um, but we think is a great companion. Um, if you all are familiar with the state lens, this will give you some additional um, tools and things that you can use to help deepen your work. So um, there's an embedded video and we're gonna really hope that it works. <laughs> see. Okay. Nope. Oh, I need to get my... So while we're waiting, I just wanted to plug the College Access Corps is actually seeking about two to three more sites. And so if any of you all are interested in having an AmeriCorps help you in running your um, mentorship program at your site, this would be a great way to have someone help out with that endeavor and also provide a more in-depth understanding, hopefully, of the equity lens, because that's what we do train our members in. Cool. Can we back it up to the very beginning? Awesome. And there should be sound. <laughs> so this is, um, while we're looking for the sound, this is a um, Twitter account called um, Barbie Savior, uh, and it talks about, um, it kind of spoofs some of the volunteer tourism uh, and uh, international service that happens um, around the around the world, so. Right. Well, we'll just read them as the pictures go. We don't need the sound. That's fine. Go for it. Oh, can you go back, actually? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, one more time. Who needs a formal education to teach in Africa? Not me, all I need is some chalk and some, a dose of optimism. At first, she was scared of my white skin. We are bound together by spirit and our humanity, and now by cloth. I feel like mothering all of this country's children. Just taking a hashtag slum fee amidst the dire poverty and need, feeling so hashtag blessed and hashtag thankful that I have so much more than this.
Only hours after landing, I knew that I needed no more time to make a permanent, lifelong decision. One week later, I committed with a tattoo of Africa that says, Te amo, I love you, in Spanish. Even among this devastation and poverty, among so much need, a girl's got to relax from time to time. The people living in the country of Africa are some of the most beautiful humans I have ever laid eyes on. I feel so insignificant next to my new friend, Promise. Learning to dance like a native. May the moment, may the movement of my hips be as intense as the belief I have in myself. We're gonna have you go into small groups at the end of this. So we just want you to pay attention to these pictures. We're gonna start thinking and critiquing how some of this might show up in our own programs and in our own selves. Barbie has ditched her riding gear, her ball gown, and her ballerina costume and traveled to Africa to help the people there while still managing to stay fashionable. That is at least according to a much talked about Instagram account, Barbie Savior, which is charting her imaginary volunteer journey. It starts with her saying farewell to her home in the US and wondering if the quote, sweet, sweet orphans in the country of Africa, quote, are going to love her in the way she already loves them. The satirical account encapsulates what some see as the white savior complex, a modern version of Rudyard Kipling's White Man's Burden. The 19th century Kipling poem instructing colonialists to, quote, fill full the mouth of famine and bid the sickness cease, unquote. Today, Barbie Savior says she is going to love the orphans, quote, who lack such an amazing Instagram community, end quote. Because of the history of slavery and colonialism, many people in Africa find such attitudes deeply patronizing and offensive. Some argue that, aid, that the aid industry can be a counterproductive as it means African countries will continue to rely on outside help. U.S.-based Nigerian author Tejokol descri Tejo describes the complex in, in a 2012 essay as a belief that, quote, a nobody American or Europe, European can go to Africa and become a godlike savior or at the very least have his or her emotionally needs satisfied. Okay. We can stop the video there. So what I'd like you to do um, is we're actually going to consolidate tables so that we can have more robust conversations. We're going to be going in and out of small group and then we, what we call call and response. So you're going to have a chance to talk. We're going to ask you a little bit, um, not everybody, but just like peppers of what happens. Um, so we're going to ask you to consolidate tables. If you have less than, you know, if you have like three people, um, you probably want to join or less, join another table. Um, and we're going to start by talking about where have you seen this? Um, you can start by saying, you know, those people we don't know that I've seen on Instagram or Twitter. Um, if you want to get really vulnerable, you can talk about your own programs, where have I seen this? If you want to get super vulnerable, you can talk about where have I done this? Um, we're not going to require you to get that vulnerable, but if you want to, you can. So go ahead and merge your tables, and then we're going to take about five minutes to talk uh, about... Before you start... Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> One quick thing. Um, when we talk about uh, implementing an equity lens, I think, um, you know, we talked about earlier in the session, uh, Lori was talking about those difficult conversations. Sometimes those happen um, without us really thinking that they're going to happen. Um, and we don't have guidelines in place. We don't have ground rules set up. We don't have a way of engaging with each other. So we wanted to just share um, ours with you um, in case something comes up that um, you need to talk through at your tables. Um, so, first off, um, our guideline is that we, in all of our trainings and all of our work, we believe that racial inequities are pervasive, preventable, and unjust, which means we don't argue whether or not they exist. We start from a place that, yes, they're real, and that's not up for argument. 
Mistakes and failures are part of the process. Separate the person from the mistake. Acknowledge impact over intent. This is not to say that intention isn't important. However, it's more important to assess the impact that your intent is having to see if it has the impact that you intended, right? And so really paying attention to that impact will help you create a better program during assessment processes. We ask everyone to pause, listen, reflect, and then respond. New, normally what we're doing is we're listening halfway while we're coming up with our response and then we're immediately responding. So around difficult conversations we ask that you pause, listen fully, then pause and reflect, then respond. Go slowly. We also ask that you focus on the immediate, personal, and local, creating a about yourself situation so that we're not talking over people about their truths, we're talking about our truths and that which we are aware of and that we have experienced and know. And sit with discomfort. Um, when people are expressing themselves in ways that maybe are unfamiliar to you or that you're uncomfortable with, um, discomfort at its root is the root of all learning and growth. You know, if we're not, um, if I'm not thrown into that moment where I'm like, ooh, I don't really know this, um, then I'm not gonna learn anything new. So we ask you to sit with that discomfort it's also why one of our guidelines for interaction, I want you to think of how many times you all have done ground rules. One of our ground rules is not respect. Respect everyone's opinion. Um, because that can get translated into don't make me uncomfortable talking about race. That feels disrespectful. So we don't use respect. We say sit with discomfort. Acknowledge that it's gonna be there and that's okay. Yeah, maybe even write down why, you know. Um, and then finally, self-care. Uh, within a larger context of trauma, healing, informed engagement, it's really important to, again, understand what feelings are coming up inside of you and take care of yourself. If you do need to step away, if you need a moment of reflection, then feel free to take it. And don't be afraid to pause and sit in silence when necessary. Okay, so with those ground rules in place, Go ahead and have your conversations around where you've seen um, the Savior Complex come up, either out there, um, in the program, or in here. Go ahead. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and have our runners go ahead and just come around to the tables. Runners, you can be pretty sporadic, just go to a table. And someone at that table, if you would mind kind of sharing out some of the things that were discussed, that would be wonderful, thank you. I usually call this the Donahue moment, but since both of our runners are women, I guess it's like Jenny Jones and Sally Jesse Raphael. <laughs> so what came up? Where were some of the places that people saw this? I'm gonna test the mic. Mic, a mic little hotter. A little bit. Boop, 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 boop. All right, here we go. <laughs> we were just talking about um, how sometimes um, how we interact with uh, people who maybe um, speak other languages, for example, Spanish, and how recently um, there was a situation where uh, student employees were talking in Spanish uh, behind the front desk to themselves when there was no line and no one to help right then. And uh, a supervisor told them that they should not be speaking Spanish because it makes other people feel uncomfortable. Uh, and you know what that leaves to our students who might speak Spanish uh, is left thinking that it's not appropriate to um, live in their culture and their language uh, and the inclusivity or lack of that um, was messaged I think so we were just talking about how maybe our own interactions within the college and with our students who are diverse and what that looks like is some work that we um, might have to do great thank you we had one over here. Okay, can you hear me? Am yeah. Okay, good. Um, so this is more of a personal um, experience one, but, um, and then also my younger brother, who's he's 10 years younger than me, so um, kind of an extension of that. Um, but we both went to um, private religious schools for our K through 12 um, with mission trips that we went on and experienced um, the, the Facebook, MySpace, Instagram effect rather profusely in the groups that we went with. Um, and my brother has come home from that uh, 
finding that it felt very hollow as an experience um, and wants to do something different because he doesn't feel like it was the the right impact is kind of what I got from him so awesome thank you so for sharing that's critical reflection yeah who else we got one back. way in the back that's a real runner <laughs> do you have your Fitbit Goodbye, on? Runner. <laughs> So I use the, uh, oh, that's loud. I use the uh, example of sports, um, just because I played sports. And uh, so when I think of the white savior, I immediately thought of coaches, right, um, and black athletes. Mm. And um, since this is a higher ed, I'm thinking of like higher ed here in, in college sports and NC2A in general. And um, I think of like football, basketball, the money-making sports where the scholarships you got on TV and the, um, the hierarchy of that where you have a huge percentage of black players and a huge percentage of white administrators and head coaches. So they grab these kids, they bring them here and um, they have the sense of you saved my life, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. Um, and I think of um, when I saw that um, Dabo Sweeney was the head coach of Clemson and he just recently had a, a great speech when he said sports um, basically eliminates race. I bring these guys together and black players and Polynesian players and white players all get, to get along and I'm a white guy from, um, from the south and we're all hunky dory. And um, so when I saw that, that's kind of exactly what, what I thought about. And um, also uh, his quote before, a year earlier with Kaepernick, how he was saying that, um, telling his players not to make, uh, not to say anything, but, uh, and said that there's not an issue with race, but it's an issue with sin, um, and to kind of keep their mouth shut. So it, that's kind of what I got when I saw that. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to take one more. Um, I want us to think, though, how often do we in our programs use that language around the opportunities we're providing, right? The, the poor kids who need our support, who need our help. At risk. Mm -hmm. And then over here, I see some hands. Okay, we'll take two, two or three more. Yeah. Where's oh, you're going here? Sorry. I, okay. I went to a, um, a restorative justice conference in California this past weekend, and um, the vast majority of um, keynotes and, um, and and presenters to the to the larger group were were people of color um, and people who had been in this um, working on on restorative justice for decades. And then I went to my last workshop, and it was about it, the name of it was um, practicing what we preach using restorative justice inside of our offices or our, our organizations. And I got in there and the, and the presenter was a white woman. And then the more she talked, um, the, the more apparent it, it became that her entire organization was white. I mean, well, entire organization, there were four people in her office. So, and she was saying how they use it and how it worked well and, and it, it, it just struck me that this was the example that we were being given of how to use restorative justice, which is, which, which comes out of um, cultures of color um, all over the world. But, and yet here I sat listening to a white woman say that it was working with her four white, you know, the four white people in the office and how, um, I don't know. I guess it was an over. It felt like it was an oversimplification and and very um, co-opted, uh, rather than the uh, the the, gen hmm, the the spirit in which restorative justice in those in those cultures uh, were was meant to to be um, practiced. My first note of the, I write notes all the time. It's my first note of the presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, go for it. 
Okay, um, so I'm an international student advisor, and I'm also a white woman. And international education and folks that work with international students were like oversaturated saturated with white women who essentially have that Barbie complex. <laughs> um, it's interesting because right now I'm like starting to run the peer mentor program at the University of Oregon for international students. And it's different than some models of the peer mentor program because there's both domestic and international students working on it. And I, it's also oversaturated by like the domestic students are all white women as well. And so it's something that, I don't know, I'm definitely getting to grapple with and, and respond to and be able to talk about, well, how do we talk about what we're doing and how we're supporting the students and also like how we're supporting that like student development. Because one of the things with, I've experienced within my field is a lot of us um, white women are <laughs> like, over helpful with certain things so that the students aren't actually challenged in certain ways or it's like it's kind of some people take the mom complex and it's really a it's a difficult thing to navigate um, and also I rem in my previous position there were two of us in an office that were both white women blonde haired blue eyed and so then the when people would come in and talk to us about Americans they also had this very um, interesting problematic view of who Americans were and that Kim and I represented like all of America um, and so it was something that like I really value my current office because they've tried to diversify their office you know like um, so that people understand <laughs> that America is much more diverse than who I am. <laughs> Thank you so much that actually speaks really well to all of your comments really spoke well to this presentation. I just wanted to share that when I was a study abroad student in Ecuador in 20, 2005, um, I was one of the only people of color in the group. I think I may have been the only one. And my uh, supervisors actually took me aside and told me I was going to have a different experience. They were like, it might actually be better. But <laughs> they, um, when I went to um, many of the areas, nobody believed that I was from the United States because they believed that people from the United States were white. And so that was a really interesting uh, realization to come up against. Um, it, it's very true in intercultural education, especially for um, white women to sort of dominate that field. So thank you for that example. So I want to take a quick pulse of the room. People have been saying words like white and racism and colonialism, and I'm just wondering how we're feeling. People, like, are we, are we kind of like, uh... Thumbs up, thumbs down yeah, are in the we, middle? Are we good? A little bit shaky, like this is making me super uncomfortable. Okay, okay, good. Just wanna, I just want to gauge. These aren't conversations that we have frequently, right? And I know when I first started in this work, when somebody would be like, well, you as a white man, I would have that little moment of like, <gasps> like <gasps> they called it out. <gasps> Duh. Right? I'm a white man. Yes, that's a thing. Let's talk about it. Um, so we are going to talk about it. We're going to jump into the lens, but we first um, are going to start with some definitions. We also need to say, though, there's a lot to this work. And if you are new to this work, we are not going to give you definitions for everything that we talk about. There's just not time. But we are hoping that it will make you curious and you'll do your own work, or you'll call us up and say, hey, Josh, Casey, help me out. Um, what did that mean? Talk to me about that. So we're just going to give you some basic um, definitions now. So when we define racial equity, we talk about it as an outcome more. It is when race cannot be used to predict success and when and we have successful systems, structures, environments, and relationships that work for all. So it's an outcome of racial justice, the work that we do for racial justice. That is fair and just distribution of resources and opportunities, economic and social systems that are sustainable and sustain all people. It also includes the meaningful engagement of communities of color in planning, decision making, and evaluation. When we talk about the equity and empowerment lens, that's the empowerment piece. That's why I made a note about your comment um, we have to be very careful. I'm talking right now about my white skin. Um, as an executive director of an organization that is predominantly staffed by people of color, that works with lots of communities of color, we have to be very careful around what does that engagement look like? How is that used? How is it credited? How do we talk about and acknowledge the labor, both emotional, intellectual, physical labor of the communities of color that we have partnered with so it doesn't just become, hey, we made this great workshop and it's all about us, right? So it's important that we have meaningful engagement. It also means in authentically embodying um, racial equity, healing, and empowerment principles. So it isn't good enough 
to be talking about it with the students, you have to be living it. You have to be looking at your own um, policies, procedures, practices, supervision, all of the things that go into your work. You have to be just as critical of yourself. And it also takes bold and courageous long-term commitment to unearthing racism's root causes and addressing barriers. Um, I, get to, I have the privilege of getting to do this work all over the country because we're part of National Campus Compact. And I will say, um, you all are the envy of higher ed um, in many ways. People look at Oregon and say, wow, how do you have a statewide equity policy? Wow, how do you have these racks that are coming together? How are you in Oregon, which I have heard is one of the widest states in the country, talking so openly about race? Those are benefits, those are things that we can take advantage of, um, but it's gonna take a really long time. This is a system of oppression that's been created over hundreds of years. This isn't a five-year strategic plan. Great. Um, this is just another diagram to sort of go over the differences between racial justice and racial equity and equality. So racial justice does not equal diversity. Diversity just means variety, right? So when you're saying diverse populations, that could be anything, not necessarily cultural. Um, it could be geographical, abilities, sexual orientation, whatever. Um, racial justice does not equal equality. Equality means sameness. We are not treating everyone the same. We're giving everyone what they need so that they can all succeed to their definition of success. There's actually a really good blog post that you can Google that I love. It's called Equality is Toxic to Equity. Mm -hmm. And I encourage you all to look it up. It actually is really important around if we are going to um, actually achieve equity, that means that the, some of us who have a ton of privilege don't need extra supports, right? It actually means we have to be providing different levels of support based on what's it gonna take us to get to the outcome. Equality is toxic to that whole framework. It also may mean that those with privilege may actually need to step back and down so that those who have historically not had that privilege can start to gain that for the communities that they're a part of. And that becomes a very difficult process because we are all individuals and we all want to travel to Peru or we all want to help, right? And so the positionality of the individual becomes very important there. Can I, do you mind if yes. I share our conversation? Yes, So when we do. came um, today, lifting the pedagogical veil, we had a conversation around who was gonna speak first, who was gonna walk on the stage first, whose voice was gonna be the first voice that you heard, knowing that the three people ahead of us had all been white, we had the conversation. I said, you know what? I think it sets a bad message if I speak first. I'm one, the executive director, so I already have positional authority. People are gonna learn that and know it at some point. I'm white, I'm male, I'm cis. I've got all this stuff. I was like, would you be comfortable speaking first? Because I think it's important for us to be elevating the voices of a woman of color on the stage, right? But we have to be having those conversations and having intentional thought around what are the messages that we send, both verbal messages, but then also the hidden, sometimes not so hidden messages to the folks that we work with. So it's important again right. to, to be elevating and sometimes stepping back and allowing others to step forward. Yeah, remember that 80% of communication is not verbal, right? So this is how our youth learn, is by mostly visual. So who is in that room with them? Great, thank you. And then um, racial justice, can it equals equity. Um, we talk about basically racial justice is the what? What are you doing? And racial equity is the, um, actually it's the how. Racial justice is the how. How are you getting there? Racial equity is the what? What did you achieve? What was the outcome? So, right. and it um, incorporates fairness and justice uh, into the concept of what success looks like. So, um, at its basis, the Equity Empowerment Lens was created by Multnomah County beginning in about 2006 um, as a public health tool. They were looking at um, a whole host of um, inequities in um, health outcomes and saying, what could we do within the health department um, to create a tool that would help us think about these things? Um, at the basis, it's a quality improvement tool. It is not a one and done. It's iterative. You're continually going through it. You're always assessing and interrogating your processes, your practices, um, your programs, using these very mindful, reflective questions that put race and culture at the center. It can be used for any inequity, though. Right. Um, if you have data that shows, guess what, um, you know, women in this specific program are not coming in or not doing as well or they're not graduating, 
How do we apply a lens based on gender inequity? What about income inequity, wealth inequity? It can be used for anything, um, but a specific focus was put on race because very frequently when we talk about helping all students, it happens magically that kids of color are always the ones that get left behind. So we start with race, we talk explicitly but not exclusively about racial inequity. And it's a way to think differently about our work um, getting at eliminating inequities, we actually go to and look at other paradigms, other perspectives, other ways of thinking and being. And so you'll see later on in a different slide, um, really looking at how do we create wholeness and balance um, and incorporating both our mental, physical, but then also spiritual and environmental health. Um, and it's based on paradigms that are community supported, they're sustainable, and they're informed by, and we're gonna explain it a little bit more, the relational worldview model, which is based in many cultures around the world, um, indigenous, Asian, African, um, South American, but a way of looking at balance and wholeness that gets us to a, a greater definition of health, um, as well as trauma-informed approaches, um, because there is so much deep trauma when we start talking about race and inequity. Yep. Anything you wanna add? Um, no. <laughs> Um, so this is the public health framework we were talking about. Some of you may be familiar with the baby floating down the river concept. Um, basically, it just says if we're looking at, you know, uh, there's, they were looking at inequities in diabetes, they were looking at inequities in um, birth weight, all of these different things. We can look at the symptoms or we can move, that's downstream, we can move midstream and start saying, well, you know, what's going on in the, in the neighborhood, in the environment? Um, we can go up even farther um, upstream and say, well, what are the policies? What are the decision processes? What's the community factors at an international, national, state level that are leading to all of these things happening? So again, it's that interrogation and going deeper um, in asking questions around why do we see the problems that we see For instead of just building um, programs that address symptoms. Exactly, and furthermore, if you think about how a river, it takes time, right, to move downstream. And so you're really also looking at like a historiograph, in a sense, to where you have the, the sort of policies that create the symptoms, right? And so if you take that river and go back, you end up going back in time. So you really start looking at root causes that are historically based, that talk, speak to our group and social identities that often are constructed by that history. The relational worldview model. Um, so Represent, this a representation. representation. Excuse yeah, me. Yeah, I will say one note and critique yes. that has been given to this work is that um, the world, the the relational worldview model is based in some very deeply religious traditions, and so we specifically talk about this as a representation of the worldview. It is not the actual um, symbols that are used in religious ceremony because that is a deeply personal, and we neither of us. Um, practice in a way that would make me feel comfortable talking about it as if it was mine. So this is taking learning from, um, it is not um, saying this is something new. This is based in thousands of years of tradition in indigenous cultures and in Asian cultures right. um, all over the world. Yes, and I will say I do actually tend to to really do think this way. However, I am Western and so that's how I've been indoctrinated. Um, this perspective I like to think about sort of as a pot history as a pot of boiling water instead of a timeline so we in the West are used to a linear worldview model where history is in the past the future is in the future history does not matter keep going forward right many cultures around the world throughout time have thought of it more cyc cyclical of a version of time where it's relational where it goes where it expands outward. And so for example, if any of you know the brand Seven Generations, this is actually taking into account seven generations in the past and forward, as if they're living here with us right now. This more speaks to that relational worldview model where we're thinking of several different things and contexts at the same time. In this case, we're thinking of the mental context, the body context, the spiritual context, and the contextual context, meaning the what is happening at the time in your space, politically, uh, socially, etc. And so in considering these four dimensions, we're able to come to a more balanced perspective of the needs of human beings and how we can create more equitable outcomes. Great. Um, any questions on this stuff before we jump in? One thing is I started and then didn't finish. When I say history is a pot of boiling water, what I mean by that is we're here at the surface tension. 
um, kind of riding on the on the bubbles, and history is is all of the water that is in that pot, and so we're in that water still. We're just at the top of it, and every now and then, and I bet you guys can think of a few bubbles come up and pop up the surface that remind us of that history. I can think of a few just in the couple weeks that in Portland. So, so at your tables you have one of the tools of the equity empowerment lens, which is the, we call it the five Ps. Um, on the front side is this graphic, and it has some um, questions, and these are taken directly from the lens. You can find the lens online if you Google equity empowerment lens Multnomah County, it, it should pop right up. Yep. Um, but it asks us to think in a holistic manner around any specific question that we want to pose. We could have gone through a process where you all kind of came up with your own or sat in teams and workshopped a specific program, Based on the theme of the conference, we just created one around, you know, we've got questions around providing support and training to mentors who don't share an identity with their mentee. What do we do with that? What do we, how do we know if we're doing a good job? That's the question we're posing. And then the equity and empowerment lens has these four domains of people, place, process, and power. Um, that you can then go deeper in each of those, asking critical questions and trying to understand, um, are we doing a good job. What changes might we need to make? How do we know what we know, right? So we gave you the exact questions from the lens. You also have a separate handout, which is a translation for mentoring programs. This again can be used for anything. And so on the separate sheet of paper, you'll see those same quadrants, people, place, process, and power, um, but with slightly different amendments to the questions around what might this look like for a mentoring program Imagine yourself in a staff meeting and just asking these questions. How do we know whether or not our space where we do mentoring is a safe space for the people who walk in? How do we know that? What would that look like? Have we talked with anyone around what a safe space feels and looks like? That's one example of a question. So what we're going to have you do, and like I said, it's going to be call and response. Um, we're all at the same time going to be having about, what time is it? Eleven. Are we doing the purpose? We're going to have about seven minute conversations. This is not going to be, um, you know, the deep, deep, deep dive. This is just going to be kind of exploring how does this go. So we're all going to start with people, right? Use the translation for the mentoring questions and have a conversation around maybe even just one of those questions. What do you know about your own program? What do you know about how you provide support for a mentor who may not look like their mentee? What training, guidance, support are they provided to know how to bridge that relationship, right? Um, so we're gonna do that for about seven minutes, and then we're gonna come back, we're just gonna hear a little bit about what came up, and then we're gonna move into place, process, and power, and then we'll wrap up. Sound good? Okay. All right, so you've got about seven minutes, and start with the people using the questions on your uh, mentoring program translation sheet. So we're gonna have a chance for just a few tables um, to report out. Um, but a really great learning um, and opportunity for me to be vulnerable directly around our question. You know, providing support and training for mentors who don't share identities with their mentees. A great question is, how do we know that they don't share identities, right? Are we asking? Are we sharing? How are we talking about that? I made a statement on the stage that the women before me had been all white and I learned Lori is not. I saw a name and I saw a white skin privilege and I made an assumption, right? So my apologies, Lori, I'm sorry for that. Um, but it was a great learning for me because like, you know what, this applies directly to this question. We could look at a mentor and a mentee and assume they don't share an identity, but we have multitudes of identities within us and are we asking about those? So my apologies and thank you for the opportunity to learn. Um, Couple groups that want to share just a little bit about what came up when you were talking about people. I'm not gonna run to you this guy, so don't be shy, just raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm gonna represent our table. Um, so the example that popped into my head first was um, when we work with FAFSA, filing, helping students file FAFSAs, and you know, immediately you run into issues a lot with the student that maybe has DACA status or doesn't even have DACA status, and then so we put on a workshop, hey, we're gonna do a FAFSA workshop, and realizing that right away we've just alienated <laughs> 
mm -hmm. a bunch of people who don't qualify for FAFSA. So that's we we. Uh, this was our first year at the community college level, so now we know better. And next year, we're we're going to just do a paying for college workshop. You know, that's great. Thank you. What community college? Tillamook Bay Community College. Oh, oh welcome! Yay! Con oh, it's not Connie Green anymore. It's Ross Tomlin. <laughs> oh, great! Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Jeff. He, him pronouns. Uh, I work with uh, GTA and ASOSU as part of their Safe Ride program. Um, this has actually been a conversation that I've been having with my program coordinator that we, as an organization, have typically been seen as dominated by white, cis, Greek-affiliated students, and that's mm. who runs the organization, and that who get, that's who gets to, you know, be a part of it. And throughout our hiring process for new drivers this year, we have focused three at least three questions on social justice and inclusion and we were also having the conversation around how do we have training throughout the year rather than just our fall training that we have when we come back how do we do that throughout the entire year and continue that process so we can shift our image of you know this is a place for cis white greek folks to this is a place where everybody can work this is a place also where everybody can ride and feel safe getting home. Thank you, yeah. That's great. Wonderful. One last one. Back up front. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Rachel and I was, um, I've been thinking, I'm so grateful that you guys are doing this because I think um, in, you know, we had a conversation around how an answer to a lot of these could be no um, in many cases, and that idea of speaking of whiteness, um, that idea of um, there, there, it would be. How do I even say this? I was noticing that I am afraid sometimes to have these conversations with students because of doing it wrong, of not having the right impact, of. Um, making a mistake and I think a lot of that is that white stuckness and so I'm aware today that that's something I'm going to change because I think um, that's a conversation when we we are an international student peer mentoring program that is for international students um, to work with international students and it was intentional because it's both a leadership development program but we have a US students who want to become part of it and I've always been worried about the Barbie syndrome to come mm -hmm. into it and so we've had conversations, well, how would we get around that? But I'm still stuck in that, like, well, I don't want to do it wrong. But I, um, but today I'll, I'll figure out a different way. Awesome. So thank you. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yeah, when I went to Ecuador and that my supervisors had that discussion with me, I was relieved. Mm -hmm. And when I became an intercultural educator taking students abroad, I, that discussion with them relieved them because they knew that people were so scared talking about it. You know, so it's a relief when people in power can come and and open up to have those more difficult conversations. Absolutely. Thank you. Can I talk about my own experiences? Go for Please. it. Yes. Actually, I'm an international student coming from mainland China, and here I would like to not not represent the whole international student populations. Please I'm don't. just <laughs> here just to yourself. share my own experiences throughout my one year uh, experience studying and working in a predominantly white institution. Um, actually, as an international student from a uh, East developing country, which is China, and as a woman of color, and my mother language is not English, so maybe not all the people, not many people can imagine how many obstacles I have to face with, I have to um, overcome. And here, I think I like to give some examples, like through my experiences and observations in the classroom, the people who were always dominating the group discussions or speaking up in class are all white students, especially white male students. Sometimes I would like to lead a group discussion, but maybe some white student just thought I could not 
take that responsibility to lead the discussion and just took the paper. We would like to make notes on that. And honestly, I was offended, but I was still very scared mm. or afraid of to say, you are wrong. I would like to take the lead. I don't have the courage, but I, th I I'm hoping to have this courage in the future because I need to make my voice be heard. Because besides getting my master degree here, I would like to develop myself holistically, not only getting a degree. I would like to make a lot of friends and to get a very better career after graduation, no matter in the United States or back home. Mm -hmm. And the second example would be like, um, because uh, I think this incident happened, has happened recently. I didn't want to be silenced anymore. And I text one of my classmates to let her know. I was offended by her several times. I didn't want to be quiet and to comfort her after she offended me and make, make apologies several times without any commitment to make an attitude shift. Mm -hmm. So I text her and said, you offended me, you made me feel frustrated, I just wanted to let you know. And then the thing she was doing was just to distance, to shift the focus of the topic, maybe because in her eyes she was great as a quite pretty white young woman. She was a very good person. She would never do a bad thing to others. So maybe she wouldn't want to admit her mistake or wouldn't want to accept others' criticism, especially from me as an international student from China. I can imagine how many stereotyping incidents I have to face with as long as I live in the United States. Mm. But I, I'm not saying I would like to lower my standard of making friends or accepting. Uh, yeah. I just want to say, I just want to encourage all the educators, especially in higher education institutions, to be more inclusive, mm -hmm. not just say I'm inclusive, I'm open-minded, I want to create diversity for all the student populations. I think mm -hmm. all of us should make a commitment through on the day, daily basis, I think, even though sometimes we have don't have do not have the power to make a great change, a social change, but throughout the daily work, I think we can do it. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much yes. for sharing. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yes. Leadership. Yes, um, so much there. Thank you for being yeah. vulnerable and sharing that. Um, one piece that I just want to call out because I think it's going to happen. If you've come to this workshop and you're like, I want to do equity work, it's, this will happen, it just happened, you're going to get called. You're going to get called on stuff that says, people say, hey, that didn't feel good. I don't like that decision. This doesn't feel right. And we do have a problem in this country at least, this is the context I know, that we have somehow equated, you know, bad is racist, if I see myself as good, I can't be racist, so then if you call me racist, you're calling me bad, right? And I can't have that conversation. That's horrible. We just all need to say, mistakes are part of the process. I am going to, and I won't curse either, I am going to mess up big time, all the time. It's always a process of learning, and we just have to be okay with that. We can't be perfect in this work. We don't need people to be perfect in this work. We need them to be real in this work. Right. So, Next group. Yeah, next group. Um, let's, let's actually move to... Yeah, let's move. Okay, so the next one. So we're going to go down to a process now, actually. So if you could go ahead and in your groups again, sort of choose one or several, depending on the, the time, um, of the questions um, in the mentorship questionnaire 
equity piece to discuss. Go for it. So, who would like to share regarding the process and some of the questions that you discussed? Yes, thank you. One of the things that we discussed at our table was the fact that sometimes people will say, I understand, mm. when they don't really understand. It's uh, more of a, uh, an empathy situation and or that's a great time to find out more about what that person is talking about. But don't just, like I said, try to sympathize, to tell them that, you know, hey, I understand when you haven't been there or you haven't walked a mile in that person's shoes. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. We can build into our processes asking the question or responding with what do I understand from what you just said. Another comment? There's a lot of rich conversation out there. Here we go. Oh, over there. So for me, the process one really related to your picture of the stream. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens much further upstream. And I think in higher ed, we are particularly guilty of um, wanting people who have higher education experience. And so even to get in the pipeline for some of our, whether it's mentoring programs or positions or internships or whatever it is, um, we somehow equate that if you have higher ed experience or you must have that in some way or a degree in some way. And so we're already further up the pipeline making some decisions versus writing things in ways that would allow people with a variety of experiences to actually get into the pipeline. And so even when it comes to where we're then interviewing, decisions that have been made way before in the system have really limited yes. um, what we're able to do. So this one for me really ties to that stream you set up because it's those decisions from the very beginning of who we're even allowing into the pipeline and mm -hmm. how we couch that. Absolutely, yeah, I think it's a brilliant comment. Right, I mean, who were the universities meant for in the first place, right? Or schools for that matter. Thank you. Somebody else. This is, uh, because of time, we're only gonna do the first two, so this is your last opportunity if you want to share with the group, and I understand that everybody likes to share in big groups, um, but I just wanna let you know, we're not gonna break into another small group, so. The other one, too, that we had talked about was sometimes I think that we try to go to the other extreme in trying to make people feel comfortable or included, and that sometimes we forget that people are just people, mm -hmm. and they don't want to be looked at as a particular race or a gender or ethnicity, or you know, they just want to be looked at as a person, and sometimes we forget that by trying to be including everybody. Right, That's there's a fine line, right? How do you diversify a staff without tokenizing, without calling on only the people who you claim have that knowledge, cultural knowledge to share with everyone, you know? Right, and also not assuming that necessarily everybody wants that to be the identity they lead with, right? right. When Casey and I were talking about should we have you come up front and should we call that out to the audience, it was a question of, is that something you want to do, right? Because um, not everybody wants to make that a point, not everybody wants, but we still need to create the structures that allow us to do that if they do. That's, yeah. the, that's the point. Um, 
So I have a quick story to tell because Casey and I actually sat down in supervision. Um, our equity empowerment core is wrapping up a grant cycle and so we were doing an equity lens analysis on how the program went. And it had some great outcomes. It also had some really significant challenges. And one of the things that we heard from members was how disconnected the colleges and universities where most of them were placed were from the K-12 schools. And so when we had created this grand grant application and we're working with our college partners, we said, wouldn't it be great if your college students had an opportunity to be trained on culturally re relevant mentoring and that they could then partner with K-12 students who they shared an identity with and we could really show um, their cultural wealth as a resource for the institution, not from a deficit, right? That it isn't about helping these poor brown kids get into college, but guess what? The colleges and universities need you to have a high um, world-class education. Diversity, um, diversity of perspective, cultural wealth, is a richness that you bring to the institution. And that was this, the grand plan, right? And so we asked each of the colleges to identify a K-12 partner that they work most closely with. And we wrote the grant and we you know, built it that way. When we went into the process circle of the equity lens, what we learned was we had a letter of support from the college and university, but we didn't require a letter of support from the K-12 school. And so a lot of our members, once they got in and they got trained and they went through you know, months of kind of building their application and recruiting their college students and they're ready to go in about February? Mm -hmm. January, January, February. February. They show up at K-12 school doors and said, hey, we're your Equity Empowerment Corps member. And the school is like, what's that? Who are you? <laughs> like, you're our partner. You work with Portland State. You work with Pacific. You work with, and they're like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. We had missed a huge process piece, right? around meaningful engagement, around reciprocal partnerships. Um, and so we said, okay, we need to be building that into our application process. If you want to be part of the program, you have to have a you know, letter of support from college and university. We also need a letter of support from the K-12 school that makes sure that they know that you've signed them up for this, right? With a person, with a person at the institution who can say, yes, we want to do this and I have the authority to make that decision for this school. And then who's the actual person that we're going to work with so that they know and that they're member can connect with. So this is just one example of how asking these questions can get us to, again, that continual improvement cycle. It doesn't stop. We have to continually be going back and asking these questions. But just one quick example that happened to us in the last month where we critiqued our own program. We're like, oh, whoops, that's a big process issue. Yeah, huge process issue. So the, do you want to talk a little bit about the logic model? Just one of yeah, the other tools. Yeah, so we're not going to be able to get to the other questions today, power in place. However, there may be times with this tool, also you can create your own questions, right? We, we, I modified the questions for the mentoring program. You might have other questions that are more specific for yours, right? You might come across questions that you just simply don't know the answer to, and it actually could be because of capacity, of individual capacity and understanding the issues, of organizational or institutional capacity, of being able to address those issues, and because of systemic capacity to actually, because of the way our systems are set up to ignore certain issues, right? And so there's this logic model that also comes with the Equity and Empowerment 5Ps tool, it's called the Equity and Empowerment Logic Model. It's found on the same website um, as the Multnomah County Equity and Empowerment Lens, and it has an individual, an institutional, and an organization, or excuse systemic. me, a systemic um, columns of questions and action items to ask so that when you do or if you do most likely when you come to these sort of barriers and not even knowing how to answer the question you can go to that logic model and see are we do we even have the capacity have we set up the capacity to answer this question what is it that we're not doing individually institutionally or that is set up systemically that creates barriers to answering those questions and that might help you think of different avenues around those barriers. It's also a great tool. I've heard this um, sometimes from college presidents. Um, you know, I'm worried about putting equity in our mission statement or in our strategic plan because how do I assess that, right? Other than the long term, more students are graduating, how do I assess it? And the logic model actually takes you um, from the outcome you want to 
what are the outputs you would see, what are the activities that would lead there, what are the cr conditions you need to create to even be able to get into this work. And so it's a pretty rich tool. Um, we'll you know, invite you to just kind of explore more. We're also um, available um, if you have questions. We'll be around for most of the day. Um, I did have two plugs for Campus Compact. Casey already did one of them. Um, but you know, when um, you heard the story of how AmeriCorps kind of helped Aspire, um, we host AmeriCorps programs all over the state. We actually have two programs that are currently looking for host sites. One is Casey's College Access Core program, which is a mentoring, uh, well, coaching um, <laughs> program. And then we also have a program called Connect to Complete, which places a full-time AmeriCorps um, with K-12 schools or community colleges that want to be doing um, either attendance work at the K-12 level or community engagement, um, kind of student engagement, keeping community college students feeling connected to their institution. Um, so if you're interested in that, we are looking for host sites. Come give us your cards. See us afterwards. It's a full-time member for a year. It's great. And then I just kind of wanted to end. We talk a lot today, and we're going to talk a lot about college and career readiness. And I think that that term is very loaded for it's all about them being ready for the university, the university that's entrenched in this institutionally and systemically racist history that never wanted them to succeed in the first place, that's upholding systems that provide barriers for them and that do not support them. And so how do we become ready for them? How do we shift our culture to really create spaces in which they're able to come to a space and learn about cultures and methodologies and science or whatever they're interested in in a way that's equitable for them so that they are empowered to have agency in their own life and therefore value in their communities, right? And so that they can uphold a system that works for them instead of does not. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>